Hey guys, and welcome back to our series on procedural generation. This is not so much a basic video, it's getting a little bit more into the intermediate advanced territory, depending on who you talk to, of course. But what we're gonna look at today is combining meshes. So this can be a really common problem when you're generating things procedurally, you create a lot of objects, especially if you're doing it from small pieces, right? Like we have done in our, uh, our tree example, we have thousands of these little leaf quads, right? And that can add up in terms of performance. When I did the first version of the scene, I think I was seeing something like 25, 30 frames a second with the, with the number of objects spawned that I had. So I felt like, you know, maybe we need to do a little optimization here. And so what we've done is we've created a technique to combine these meshes together. Now there's some documentation of this in the Unity manual. I've kind of modified it a little bit and I've also implemented it in such a way that we can create multiple combined meshes for our different materials because we have three leaf colors and so we're gonna be combining them into three objects, one for each color. It's a little bit more advanced, but can become a critical thing to be able to do as you start to generate larger scenes and start to think about performance. So I think it's gonna be valuable for you guys. So let's check it out. Here in my mesh combining scene, if we enter play mode, what you'll notice right away is that in our previous video, when we were spawning everything as separate objects, we were getting around 24, 25, frames a second. Now we're back up to a much more healthy and manageable 150, 160 frames a second. And you notice that if we fly around the scene view, right, we're really doing fine in terms of performance, right? And this is because we have combined together many of the meshes that were costing us performance before. So let's look at how we did that. If we look at one of our trees here, one of our plain leaf tree combiners, let's zoom in on it. But what we can see is that this is composed of the trunk as before, and then we have this leaf cluster spawner outer, and it has child objects for yellow leaves, red leaves, and orange leaves. Each of these has a mesh renderer and a mesh filter along with a material already assigned. This is assigned in the prefab. Now, the leaf cluster spawner outer object has a mesh combining area spawner script on it. So previously we were using many separate components which were assigning the material, assigning the rotation and so on. Now we've consolidated things basically into one script that's doing everything. The reason that we've done this is because now when we're doing mesh combining, we really need to be able to carefully control the order of operations. So we need to make sure that the rotation is set before the objects are combined. We need to make sure that we can control what is assigned to what material and so on. So let's take a look at the script. We have our public field for the item to spread, right? This is the item we're spawning. Again, this is our leaf quad prefab. We have the number, the spread values. This is the same as what we've seen in our previous videos, right? It's the space we're gonna spawn over. Now, we've added in a vector three for the random rotation constraints as Euler angles in this component. So this is now a public variable in this component. And then we've added this array for our mesh color objects, which are three objects which have an empty mesh filter with a material assigned. Then we have a private list of all of the objects that we're going to combine. We're kicking off the process from start. We have this function called spread color and combine. And the first thing we do is spread, right? We're going to spawn all of our different items as separate objects by calling the spread item function. That's down here. And so what we're doing first generating a random position, the random position is consists of the negative and the positive spread for each of the coordinates as we've seen before then we're instantiating a clone using that position and importantly we're taking in the rotation that's stored in the prefab instead of using quaternion.identity which is basically no rotation we're saying give me the rotation that's stored in the prefab and rotate the object that way this is important for our flat leaves right because the flat leaves have a 90 degree rotation on the X that we're using in the scene. Then we're setting the rotation of the new object here 
using this new randomized by axis function. Randomized by axis takes in our public variable from the inspector, our random rotation constraints, and a reference to the transform of the cloned object. In the function here, we are accepting those two parameters and then using them to generate a quaternion called random constrained rotation. This is a mega long single line of code, right? This is all actually one line. It looks extra crazy because we've got the bigger font. So first of all, we're doing this all as Euler angles, right? I'll go through X and it's the same thing for Y and Z. We're taking the Euler rotation X coordinate, adding a random rotation to it, right? Of either negative or positive the value in the constraints, right? So if the value was 90, it could be negative 90 or positive 90. We're adding that in so that if we choose to pass in 0, 0, 0, there will be no rotational change applied instead of resetting our object to a rotation of 0, 0, 0. We're generating that rotation around all three axes and then returning it, right? Our function here returns a quaternion so that we can simply pass in the function when we are setting the rotation and use the return value to set the rotation of the transform. Now, once we've done that, we're setting the parent to one of our mesh color objects that we're picking randomly from the array. If you already had colors assigned to the meshes that you were combining that you wanted to preserve, what you could do is make a mesh a mesh color object in this case with each of the materials of the existing objects and then check if the object that you're combining matches the material of one of those objects and then assign it to that object right in this case i'm doing it randomly so i don't care but that would be the way to solve that if you wanted to preserve existing colors so basically we assign the object as a child of one of the colored objects and then we add it to our list of game objects to combine, right? That's the end of spread item. Then spread color and combine continues by looping over in a for loop our mesh color objects and calling this combine meshes function, passing in each of the mesh color objects. This function down here, and this is actually a adapted version of a function that's in the Unity documentation. If you look up combined meshes in the Unity documentation, there's another version there. This is a little bit different. One of the issues is this temporarily setting the position to zero to make the matrix math easier. If you're moving things around, you can find some weird offsets applied to your combined meshes. So what we do is we just temporarily move the stuff we're combining to zero combine it and then move it back to where it's supposed to be. It's a little hacky. You could probably, if you were better at matrix math than I am, you could just do the matrix transformation, but this is a way that works and it's simple. Then we get all of the mesh filters that are children of our object that we pass in as an argument, right? So we're passing in one of the mesh color objects, which is apparent to all the leaves. So we're gonna go through and get all the mesh filters of all those leaves, all the quads. Then we're gonna create an array of structs of the type combine instance called combine. And then that's gonna be equal to a new combine instance array of the same length as our mesh filters array, right? So we're gonna create a combine instance for each of our mesh filters. Then we're gonna run a while loop. This could have been a for loop, we used a while loop instead. We're going to loop over the mesh filters and we are going to get the shared mesh from the mesh filter, assign it to the combine. Then we are going to do the matrix transformation where we translate from the local space of the object to world space and assign that to the combine instance. This is where things can go wrong if you don't set the position to zero. And this is where you would insert some matrix transformation to 
if you wanted to get rid of that setting to zero thing, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So we're just gonna do it this way. Then we're gonna deactivate the original game object, right? We're gonna turn it off and then we're gonna iterate the loop. Once we've looped over everything, then we are going to get a reference to the mesh filter, which so far is empty, that's assigned to our parent object, to our mesh color object. We're gonna put a new mesh in there. We're gonna generate a new mesh and put it in there. So then we are gonna actually do the combining operation. And let's just take a quick look at the documentation for that. So what we're doing is we're taking the mesh of the mesh filter and calling the combine meshes function, passing in our array of combine instances, and then the parameters true and true, which correspond to whether we should merge the sub meshes and whether we should use matrices. So merging the sub meshes defines whether the meshes should be combined into a single sub mesh and use matrices defines whether the transform supplied in the combined instance array should be used or ignored. Once we've done that, we're gonna make sure that the object where we've now created the new mesh is active by calling set active true. And finally, we're gonna return our object to the original position back from zero. Now that we've done the matrix calculations, we're gonna return it to the original position. Now I left in here commented out how you can add a collider to the mesh if you need to, which is just gonna be add component mesh collider on the combined mesh. I figured there are probably people who are gonna to wanna to do that. So I just left it in there, commented out. You can turn it on if you need it. I didn't need it for the leaves. I don't need a collider for the leaves, but you can, uh, you can do it that way if you need to. So then the result is if we look, for example, at our yellow leaves, we can see all the original leaves are here deactivated, right? We could also destroy them theoretically. And then here, the yellow leaves object now has a new mesh in the mesh filter, and it's using the material that's assigned to it in the mesh renderer to display the combined mesh. And that's true for the red and the orange, and each of these outer, inner, and ground has those same three child objects, one for each material. We need a separate child for each material, and then we can preserve the materials or basically have new meshes with the appropriate materials and the combined quads. So as you can see, right, we're getting back a lot of performance. It's maybe four or five times as fast by doing this. So I actually did this in a VR game, right, where performance is absolutely critical and got the performance that I needed and had it work. So this is really something to consider as you start to get a little bit more advanced and as you start to apply some of these procedural concepts to your games, you may really wanna to start to think about these types of optimizations. All right, so hopefully you guys found that useful. As you can see, not as basic as some of the other content that we've been covering, but I think once we get into this procedural generation territory and we want to generate a lot of stuff, this gets pretty important, right? We always want to create performant games as much as we can and uh, being able to maintain our performance by combining some of those meshes together is pretty useful. So if you enjoyed the video, please drop a like on the video. You can also drop a dislike on the video if you didn't like it. And uh, leave me a comment to let me know, how are you gonna use this? Do you have any questions about the technique or there's some other ways you'd like to look at it or maybe some other aspect of it you'd like to explore? If you found the content valuable, please consider subscribing. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.